want to invite you to turn um, again to the book of 1 Kings. Uh, we are going to pick up in chapter 21. As you can see from the title behind me here, uh, we are looking at the lives of Elijah and Elisha. Last time um, that we were together here, um, I looked at the introduction of Elisha, but it's kind of on hold. We don't um, get to hear more about Elisha uh, until we get into 2 Kings here in a few chapters. Um, but once again here, and we're actually skipping a chapter that doesn't mention Elijah or Elisha in chapter 20. And so we're picking up here. So I want to read, it's a lengthy chapter, it's 29 verses, but it's all another episode um, in the life of of Elijah, um, this prophet, and as this um, title here of the sermon series tells you, um, it's about trusting in God in a rebellious age, in a wicked world, in evil days. And so um, it's a very common theme, even in the world today we feel like, boy, we really live um, in a wicked time um, around the world. And I think um, as we look at this, we may realize we're not in uncharted waters here. These aren't unprecedented times, but we do get insight into how God works and what God might say to us. How do we live um, in these times? So let's read um, uh, 1 Kings chapter 21. We'll start with the first verse. Hear the word of the Lord for us today. Now Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So we're acquainted with Ahab. Naboth is new, introduced into this story. He just so happens to have this vineyard that's right next door um, to what is kind of a summer palace, um, some people might say, for Ahab. It's not the main um, place where he has a, a, um, a palace or a house. Verse 2, and after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father's. And Ahab went into his house, vexed and sullen, because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. And he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. Now I think we're supposed to see that and go, that doesn't seem very kingly or um, royal, does it? Um, to be vexed and sullen and um, pouting in the bed. But Jezebel, y'all remember Jezebel, the wicked queen um, who brought all the, the Baal and Ashtoreth worship with her from Sidon um, when she came. She came to him and said to him, why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, give me your vineyard for money or else if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And notice there on that, you notice that's not exactly what Naboth said. Um, that tends to happen when we're trying to get our way outside of what God would want for us. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now govern Israel? She's making an argument. Aren't you the king? Arise, eat bread, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and to the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying you have cursed God and the king which is punishable by death then take him out and stone him to death and the men of his city the elders and the leaders who lived in his city did as Jezebel had sent word to them I want you to notice they're complicit in that. The elders and the men of this city, leaders. And so not only is Ahab and Jezebel uh, in really murky waters here, now they're inviting others to be with him. That will come to bear at the end of our reading here today. 
As it is written in the letters that she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast, set Naboth at the head of the people, and the two worthless men came in and sat opposite them, and the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned, he is dead. And as soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite when he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel. This is the third time now Elijah has been told to go and meet with Ahab. And don't forget, earlier we were told that Ahab was trying to kill Elijah. In fact, he's going to call him the enemy of Israel or my enemy again here in a minute. And yet, we read that he does go. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord. Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. I don't think we need to explain that, what kind of idiom that was from ancient language. I think we get the picture here. As a matter of fact, it's not the first time we've had that picture um, in 1 Kings. Back in chapter 15, um, the same pronouncement is made against Jeroboam, the original rebellious, wicked king of Israel. Verse 20, Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off, uh, will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me, because you have made Israel to sin. So notice he points out, not only are you sinning against the Lord, now you are causing my people to sin against me. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat, and anyone of who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Notice there's a parenthetical statement here now uh, in verse 25. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab. Now if you've been reading along in 1 Kings, that's a big statement. There's been some really rotten, evil kings um, that we've read about already, and it says Ahab was the worst, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. Well, that's a big statement. He's saying the king of Israel, of God's people, who is supposed to be the righteous and holy leader of God's people, he's acting like the people that God utterly destroyed who were pagan idolaters. So um, we get this parenthetical statement, Ahab is really bad, the worst of the worst. And then surprisingly, look what happens. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes he put on sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And in the word, uh, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the disaster upon his house. That's God's word for us today. I want to tell you about a man named Min Jai. Min Jai lived um, in the early 2000s um, in North Korea. 
And at the time, as it is today, North Korea is an atheist country. Um, and although officially, publicly, there is religious tolerance to a certain extent, um, except for things like this, the unauthorized um, religious activities are punishable um, by detention in a prison camp. Um, and oh, things like praying, reading the Bible, or having any contact with an outside missionary or Christian are forbidden and unauthorized and can land you in a prison camp. Well, Min Jai in 2004 uh, went on a lengthy business trip to China. And while there, he visited a friend's church and fell in love with Jesus and the Bible. It was a lengthy stay. He was there some months. And after he returned, uh, or after uh, his time was coming short to be in China, um, and he was baptized and began to be part of the regular worship at this church, um, he received a small Korean Bible um, in his own language, and he began to understand the scriptures better and better every day. And when Min Jai had to return to North Korea, a member of that church approached him and said, could I send you a package with some Bibles hidden in it that could be shared with other Christians in North Korea? And at first he said no. He was afraid of what might happen um, if he was caught, rightly so. But after some thought and some prayer, he agreed. And about five months after returning back to North Korea, he got word secretly that these packages were on the way, and he went in the middle of the night down to the seaport and got three duffel bags off of a boat. And after returning home, um, scared to death until he got inside of his house, he opened them, and they were full of blue jeans right wrapped tightly. And inside of those blue jeans, he found um, 10 Korean Bibles. And then it occurred to him something that he hadn't really thought about is, now what am I going to do with these Bibles? And so he hid them away, wrapped them back in that, and just began uh, to ponder on that. One day, as he's out in the street, um, he hears a man whistling what he recognized as a Christian hymn, something you never heard anywhere in North Korea. And so, still afraid of being informed upon, that's how things go in North Korea, he decided in the middle of the night, he took those ten Bibles, wrapped them in those same blue jeans, put them in one of those bags, and he just left them at that man's door and then stole away in the night so as not to be found out. Um, well, that's the last he knew of that. In fact, some months later, Min Jai tried to defect to South Korea, uh, was caught, and was put in one of those prison camps. Um, and as he began to get to know some of the other prisoners there, he met a man that turns out was the uncle of the man whose door he left those Bibles at. And the story is even more remarkable that that uncle was in the prison camp because he became a Christian under the influence of that man and the ten Bibles that were left there, as did 27 other members of his family. What a remarkable thing that the Word of God going forth. I'll be glad for you Gideons to use that um, in one of your talks. Um, I don't think they were Gideon Bibles, but God's Word does amazing work. Now, I would love to tell you the end of the story is that that man, and oh, by the way, all 27 of those people who accepted Christ also ended up in a prison camp. They were all meeting together in a home and singing a hymn. A neighbor heard them, informed on the government, and all 27 were arrested and sent to a prison camp. And yet I want to pick up there because that doesn't sound like the story that you ought to tell at the beginning of a sermon. That doesn't sound very encouraging. Yes, it's great that people accepted Christ and then almost immediately got sent to prison. But it leads me to really what my first point of the sermon is today, and you may see this in the text that we read, is that the people of God are and will be and always have been subjected to injustice and persecution. It has been the unanimous experience of Christians throughout all the centuries from the day of Jesus until now. If you don't think so, pick up a copy of this. I know this picture is kind of hard to see here because it's dark. There was a book that was published in 1563 by a guy named John Fox called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it's simply that is 
John Fox in 1560s began to list all the stories of those who had given their lives that were known. He started with Stephen that we actually read about in Acts chapter 7 um, who was stoned to death after preaching in the public square there. And he goes all the way through up to the 1500s beginning to recount all the people who have suffered and most who have died for the faith. You can buy a copy of that. It's several volumes now it, since, uh, and actually John Fox died before it was published. Somebody else published it for him, but it has been updated again and again and again. And today, Fox's Book of Martyrs is updated all the way to the 21st century. And you may know this, I think the statistic goes that in the 20th century, in the 1900s, more people were martyred in those thousand or those hundred years than all of the 1800 years that preceded that since Christ. Martyrdom is not an ancient thing. It's not what Christians used uh, to be subject to. It is the reality, and it is today for many people around the world. In fact, I would commend to you if you want to read some of those stories, there's a magazine called Voice of the Martyrs, and it's dedicated solely to that of telling the stories of those who are persecuted and even suffer death around the world today. It happens every day somewhere in the world. And so when we say the people of God are subjected to injustice and persecution, that's not an overstatement. That's not a maybe that will happen at certain times in history. It always has happened, and we have no reason to think it won't continue to happen. Just like Naboth lost his life at the hands of a wicked king, so people lose their lives every day for the cause of Christ. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. I know it's hard for us as modern American Christians to think if we're persecuted, something really strange is happening and that the world is going to hell in a handbasket today because bad things happen to Christian people. Peter said it. Don't think it's strange when that happens. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, all who desire to live, live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It doesn't say maybe, might, or could. It says they will. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Therefore, we do not lose heart, because that seems to be the natural reaction to that. Boy, that's a tough pill to swallow. He says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles. I bet those 27 people in that North Korean prison camp didn't, uh, don't look at that as light and momentary. But Paul says those light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Then he gives us some advice. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, there's a little key there for us. How do we face persecution, trial, and tribulation? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on what's eternal. That what is here on earth is momentary, but what lies ahead is glorious. Sometimes that doesn't make it easier in the here and now, but it is the view that we have. And so first and foremost, the people of God are and will be subjected to injustice and persecution. And then here's the other reality. We see this in 1 Kings chapter 21. Injustice is often inflicted by the government and its courts. That's not a modern political statement. It's a historical reality. Now think in terms of this going not just back to the days of, uh, of Jesus or of Paul or of Peter. Let's go all the way back even to the Old Testament saints. Think about, I know our youth group has been studying Daniel on Wednesday mornings. They looked at Daniel chapter 3 of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown in the fiery furnace. Why? because they refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. And it was the government, it was the officials um, that inflicted that punishment upon them. The king himself was present 
when it happened and ordered it to be happened according, happened according to the law. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself is famously thrown in the lion's den. Why? Because of an act of civil disobedience. They enacted a law that said you were not to pray to anybody except to Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel prayed by his window so people would know uh, to the living true God. And the officials and the satraps had him thrown in the lion's den. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul often um, was persecuted, sometimes by the Jews, but lots of the punishment was enacted by the Roman or the Jewish authorities. He was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was stoned, and many other things, all under the guise of official governing bodies. Again, 1 John 3 says to us, Do not um, be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Can we take solace in the fact that the world hated our Lord and our Savior Jesus, whose only mission was to come to the world to seek and to save the lost, who showed compassion to all kinds of people in all kinds of places, and yet he was hated. John says, don't be surprised that the world hates you. In fact, Matthew 10 even says this, that those officials will play a part in that. Listen to what Jesus says. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. I could easily go on a rant here about what's wrong with our government today or what's always been wrong or what's likely to be wrong with it. I think it's worth pointing out it's always been the case. And though here's a reminder, no matter who's in the White House, no matter who our elected officials are, they are not the ones that preserve our lives eternally. And any hope that we put in those for things that matter in our lives is a vain hope. In fact, the Old Testament, the Psalms tells us that. It's a vain hope to put your hope in kings and horses and armies. The God is king over his people. And we shouldn't be surprised that people hate us, that even governing bodies would strike out against Christians, that would perse persecute us. I know it's deflating when that happens, and it is beginning to happen maybe more and more, but it's not a new reality for Christians. I don't think there's ever been a time in the world where Christians somewhere weren't persecuted in that way. And so just as Naboth was under the thumb of this wicked king and queen, so might be the fate of Christians in many places at many times. But let's be encouraged. Jesus stood in Naboth's place. He too was falsely accused by men of ill repute, scoundrels. Matthew 25 records that. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Jesus has been where we have been. He suffered on our behalf. And so God's people must be prepared to pay the price for standing for righteousness. Did you catch that with Naboth? He is punished by um, Ahab and Jezebel because he was doing the righteous thing. He says, far be it from me, or the Lord forbid that I should sell my inheritance. So you should know at that time, it was not against the law, or it was not against God's law um, to sell land, but it was always temporary, and it was only meant to be in an emergency. God had made provision that if in an emergency you could sell the land. But here's the thing, the Mosaic Law also inclu included the year of Jubilee. So selling your land was always just a lease. It never completely transferred to another tribe, even to another Israelite. It was to be your possession. It was a sign of being God's covenant people. I've given you something and it will not and should not be taken away, given away, or stolen. And so every 50 years, any land that had been transferred to somebody else had to be returned um, to them. And so Naboth apparently was one of the 7,000 men that Elijah had been promised had not bowed the knee to Baal or kissed Baal, as it said um, in chapter 19. And so Naboth's refusal to sell shows how well he knew his Bible. 
He knew that the children of Israel were not permitted to sell land to one another because the property belonged to the Lord. All that they had was a sign of God's lordship and kingship over them. And so when he refuses, I pointed that out when we read, Ahab pouts, Jezebel plots, and Naboth loses his vineyard and loses his life. And yet he did it for a righteous reason, because he feared God more than he feared the king. Jesus said this, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You know, Naboth could have put money. He, he knew the king wanted this land. He could have demanded a great price. He might have gotten a better vineyard out of the king for this deal. But Jesus says, For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. But we get a promise here. God will bring justice to evildoers. God brings this harsh pronouncement upon Ahab and Jezebel and the whole house he says, you have provoked me, verse 22. You have made Israel to sin. And he says, I'll make you like Jeroboam and Baasha. In fact, with Jeroboam, it says almost the exact same thing about the dogs licking up the blood, that the whole entire house of Jeroboam was destroyed. And we think, boy, God was really harsh in the Old Testament. And yet, should we forget that the New Testament says all have sinned? and fall short of the glory of God. That's bad news. And then the, the bad news gets worse, and it says that the wages of sin, so everybody has sinned, and the wages of sin is death, eternal damnation. You see, the judgment of God has always been extended. It's always been pronounced. And God is gracious that he says that his judgment will come upon the wicked. In Mark Chapter 1, Jesus preaches for the first time, or at least recorded in Mark's gospel. You know what his sermon is? Here's an exact quote from Mark chapter 1. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the whole sermon recorded in that part of Mark. Why did Jesus say repent? Because he also would proclaim further as it's, um, uh, the gospel becomes fuller to us throughout the gospels and in Paul's letter is the judgment of God is real and it is hanging over the heads of every man, woman, and child from every place, from everywhere, at all times. Our sin makes us liable to God. Um, the great author John Murray says, The scripture throughout prescribes the necessity of the fear of God under all circumstances in which our sinful situation makes us liable to God's righteous judgments. See, that's not just true for Ahab, it's true for us. God's judgment is due. The penalty for sin against God is eternal death. But the pronouncement of judgment, as Jesus said, should lead to repentance and faith. But here's what Ahab does. He's remorseful, and we're even told God notices that he's remorseful. This is a remarkable thing that it says about Ahab. It says, and when Ahab heard these words, this is verse 27, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth on his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went about dejectedly. It sounds a lot like... Uh, how he acted when he couldn't get the vineyard, except this time it's because the judgment of God has now been pronounced upon him. And maybe even more remarkable, God notices that reaction. Um, it's not very often that it's almost like God sort of nudges um, Elijah and says, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself? And so for a time, he does a gracious and merciful thing, and he says, I'm not removing the punishment, but it won't be with you, it'll be with your family. Now we could read that and say, well, that doesn't seem very fair, um, but we also read that uh, in 1 Kings as we go along, Ahab didn't change his life. Um, he didn't repent and believe, he was sorry. And we know how that goes. If you're a parent, you know the difference in sorrow and sorry I got caught kind of sorrow, right? 
And so Ahab, yes, he does what he should have done. He was remorseful and repented, um, or at least um, recognized the danger that he was in, but it didn't change him. See, the key to uh, repentance is that it's followed up with faith. In fact, we read in the very next chapter, um, somebody says, we need a prophet to come and tell us what the Lord would say in this situation. And Ahab says, uh, I only know one and don't call him because he never has anything good to say about me. In fact, Ahab says, I hate him. You see, he hadn't learned to be obedient to God's word and so he didn't want to hear another word from God because he knew what the word was. Repent and believe. So what's the big idea here? I want us to back up from the text just a minute and see what 1 Kings is supposed to do. The whole book of 1 Kings, uh, really 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings and Chronicles are all written to a people who are languishing in captivity because of their great sin against God. The whole nation of Israel has lost all the outward signs of being in God's good favor. And they are away in Assyria and Babylon, locked away from all the good blessings of God. And as with other historical books in the Old Testament, the history that's recorded here is meant to do at least two things. Yes, it's to record important events, but it's also to teach spiritual truths. Here's what Israel, and I think we, should also read in this text today. Ahab was a really rotten, evil guy. There's that parenthetical verses 25 and 26. He's the worst of the worst. He acts like the people that God wiped off the face of the earth. And yet, God is gracious in offering a word of judgment to bring him to some form of repentance. Unfortunately for Ahab, it's not full repentance and it's certainly not faith. But instead of seeing ourselves as, Ahab, uh, as Naboth in this story, I would encourage us to see ourselves as Ahab. We are the worst of the worst. All have sinned against God. And so I think what God is saying in 1 Kings to the Israelites locked away, don't be like Ahab. He was one of your kings. He led you into sin and you fully participated in it. Repent and believe in Jesus today, the New Testament would tell us. God is gracious to have sent a word to Ahab. He's even extremely more gracious to have sent his son to a rebellious nation. What's the big idea today? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Don't be like Ahab. Don't be like Israel. Repent and believe. Turn away from our wicked ways and walk in the way of the Lord. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is... Good news uh, that we hear the gospel. Even the bad news is meant to push us to the good news. And so I pray that today our sin would come to bear on our hearts, that we'd see ourselves as wicked, as following our own desires, that we have participated in the ways of this wicked generation in which we live, and yet you've offered us the free offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. And so let us repent of our sin today, that none of us is beyond the reach of your grace. No sin is greater than your grace. You are offering here, even now, the free offer of the gospel. The gift of God is eternal life for us today. Let us embrace that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together today. Let us see the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins given freely by your grace and your mercy. We ask you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Um.